Welcome to the Daily Office Lectionary. I'm Father Reed. Today we're going to look at Proper 24. Now, let's review Proper 23 real quickly. Remember, we were in Jeremiah, 1 Corinthians, and Matthew. This week we are in Jeremiah, Lamentations, and Ezra. And I'll tell you why in a few minutes. We continue with 1 Corinthians 15 and 16. We had looked at 14, 13, 14, and 15, and now we're in the second half of 15 and finishing off in 16. 1 Corinthians has 16 chapters. And then we'll look at the book of Philemon, or Philemon, whichever way you want to accent it. Philemon, I'm going to say it, Philemon, 1 through 25. Very short book, Paul's letter to Philemon. And then we'll continue on with the journey of Jesus in Matthew 11 through 12, 11 and 12, chapters 11 and 12. Now, in the Old Testament, what's going on is, remember, the dissolution of Judah, the southern kingdom. We saw the dissolution of the northern kingdom, remember I said last week, 721 B.C., by the Assyrians, very, very powerful army to the north. Well, over a couple of centuries, the Assyrians were destroyed by the Babylonians, And so in the southern kingdom, 587 deportation, 587 destruction of the temple, burning to the ground. Remember, we talked about that last week when Jeremiah prophesied that that would happen by God's will and word. And he prepared the people for that and the king. The king did not like him. Remember, they threw him in a cistern. So we have in Lamentations 1 and 2, the lamenting of that tragedy and how horrible that was to the nation of Israel. Beautiful book, Lamentations. Five chapters. Most of it is very much a tremendous sorrow for what happened with the destruction of the city of Jerusalem and the deportation of those people. A a lot of times people couple Jeremiah and Lamentations together. And then finally, Ezra is the return of the people from Babylon and Ezra and Nehemiah is about the rebuilding of the temple, uh, the uh, proclamation of the law. We see that in Ezra, the rebuilding of the wall in uh, with Nehemiah, uh, uh, attempting to rebuild the temple again after it had been razed, destroyed. So uh, we are looking at the um, the uh, healing. Of, from God, the restoration of his people. Let's start with Jeremiah 29. This is a, a, a verse in verse 11 that a lot of people like to quote. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call upon me, verse 12 of 29, you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me and when you seek me with all your heart, I will be found by you, found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. So they are captive, as I just said. God desires to bring them back from captivity. Now, this is a very significant overarching theological point, and that is when we sin against the Lord and we move against him, and he moves against us in terms of judgment, he then will move towards us in terms of forgiveness when we repent Always want to repent. Always want to repent. When we repent, receive forgiveness, and then he restores us back to him. And we're seeing, as I said earlier, that restoration in Ezra. Jeremiah 44. Let's look at Jeremiah 44. As you will see in this post, verses 1 to 14. Disaster because of idolatry. This is what the Lord says, verse 2. You saw the great disaster I brought on Jerusalem and all the towns of Judah. Today they lie deserted and in ruins because of the evil they have done. Not because the Babylonians were stronger. Not because they had a greater army and Israel had a lesser one. Because they provoked me to anger by burning incense and worshiping other gods that neither they nor you nor your fathers ever knew. Again and again I sent my servants, the prophets, who said, Do not let this detestable thing that I hate. Do not do this detestable thing that I hate. Do not do it. 
But they did not listen or pay attention. They did not turn from their wickedness or stop burning incense to other gods. Therefore, my fierce anger was poured out. It raged against the towns of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem and made the desolate ruins they are today. I begged them to turn around. I begged them to stop. They did not stop. I poured out my wrath. This is what the Lord God Almighty, the King of Israel says, 44-7. Why bring such great disaster upon yourselves by cutting off from Judah the men and women, the children and infants, and so leave yourselves without a remnant? Why provoke me to anger? Verse 10. To this day they have not humbled themselves or shown reverence, nor have they followed my law and the decrees I set before you and my fathers. Brothers and sisters, again I plead with you. Humble yourselves before God. Show reverence to God. Follow the law of God. Do the things he's called you to do. If you fall away from the Lord, repent and return to him. Do not blithely go by and disregarding the word of the Lord, expecting things to go well for you. You must listen to what the word of the Lord is, and you must do it. I pray for all of us that we would do that. Jeremiah after Jeremiah is the book of Lamentations, chapter 1. Let's just read a couple of these verses. Chapter 1. How deserted lies the city. I just read that in Jeremiah 44. Once so full of people, how like a widow is she who was once great among the nations. She who was queen among the provinces has now become a slave. Verse 5. Her foes have become her masters. Her enemies are at ease. The Lord has brought her grief because of her many sins. Her children have gone into exile, captive before the foe. This is extremely bad news. 10 to 12. The enemy laid hands on all of her treasuries. Uh-oh, they've got the money. They, and all, She saw pagan nations enter her sanctuary. So disgraceful. Those who had forbidden to enter your assembly. All of her people groan as they search for bread. They barter their treasures for food. Now they're starving. To keep themselves alive. Look, O Lord, and consider, for I am despised. Is it worth it? Is it worth it, brothers and sisters, to go against the word of God? Is it worth it to do your own thing and to travel your own way? Is it worth it to rebel and offend the Lord? No, it is not. The consequences are too great. I plead with you, with us, as we continue to study the daily lectionary together, listen to the word of the Lord. I exhort you to hear the word of the Lord. Do not disgrace the word of the Lord in any way. Ezra. Now, Ezra is not a book that is prophetic. It is a history book. And it comes after First and Second Chronicles. You've got First and Second Kings. Remember Second Kings 25 last week. The dissolution, the fall of Jerusalem, the dissolution of Judah. Then we have First and Second Chronicles, which is a different take on First and Second Kings. It's just written for a different reason in a different way. Then we have Ezra 1, 1 through 11. This is great. Verse 1, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, back to Jeremiah again, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, one of the great kings of all time, to make a proclamation throughout his realm and to put it into writing. Now, God is moving upon a pagan king to set his people free. You think God's not in charge? This is what Cyrus, the king of Persia, says. Persia says, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he's appointed me to build a temple for him in Jerusalem in Judah. Any one of his people among you, may his God be with him, and led, let him go up to Jerusalem in Judah and build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem. So what they did is they went back to Jerusalem, and they by the grace and mercy of God and the movement of God upon Cyrus, he was able to do some significant things with them. Okay? Ezra chapter 3, 1 to 13. Ezra 3, the rebuilding of the altar and the rebuilding of the temple. Again, God is in control. God is the ultimate judge. 
God is the one that saves. God is the one that gives grace. God is the one that subdues our enemies. We want to be on God's side. We want to stay on God's side. Ezra 3, 1 to 13 talks about the rebuilding of the altar and the rebuilding of the temple. Very important, okay? And all the people, verse 11, gave a loud shout of praise to the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. So they were allowed to go back and restore these wonderful traditions and wonderful ways that God had blessed them in the past. Remember, they were destroyed by the Babylonians, and now Cyrus has been moved by God Almighty to give them an opportunity to rebuild. Chapter 4, verse 7, see that on Saturday's post, 4, 7, 11 to 24, okay? And in the days of Xerxes, king of Persia, Bishlam, Mithdarath, Tabil, and the rest of his associates wrote a letter to enter Xerxes, the letter was written in Aramaic script in the Aramaic language. Go back now to verse 11. This is the copy of the letter. The king should know that the Jews have come up from here. You have gone to Jerusalem and are rebuilding that rebellious and wicked city. They are restoring the walls and repairing the foundations. Okay? And so then he just spells more of that out to them. There's opposition to the rebuilding. So... That's one of the problems of this situation is God is now, he's got to move someone to restore them in such a way as they can come back and restore their land. But he has to restore and speak through this Persian king who destroyed the Babylonians so that he could be in charge, the king of Persia. The Persians came after the Babylonians. And after the Persians, by the way, for you history buffs, is are the Romans. You've heard of them. In the meantime, Persia's in control. They are allow the folks that were deported in Babylonia, to Babylonia, to, to Babylon, to return. There is a tremendous amount of support for doing it. They did a great job of doing the work, but there was opposition, and they had to call on God on a regular basis. The history here is quite eclectic this week, Proper 24, because you have Jeremiah, you have a couple of scriptures from Lamentations, and you have several scriptures from Ezra. Enjoy. 1 Corinthians 15. Remember I was talking about 1 Corinthians 15 in terms of Christ has destroyed death. He has been raised from the dead. He is, was buried, and on the third day he rose again. In 1 Corinthians 15, 30-41, we talk about the resurrected body. Now, this is actually a little bit complicated. I don't want to go into great detail on it. I just want you to read it again. If you have notes or have a commentary or you have um, a study Bible, that's often helpful. It's not obviously comprehensive. More of a couple of commentaries would uh, solve that problem. But it gives you a little bit more to think about than just reading it straight out. A lot of times when you have more complicated passages, you need some study helps to help you to work through those passages. Okay? So he's talking about the spiritual body. He's talking about the physical body. He's talking about what's going to happen to the body when you die. He's going to talk about what's the future of this body. Uh, And so enjoy reading about that. Now, the key passages that I want to bring to you to your attention um, today is death has been swallowed up with in victory okay this is verse 54 of first Corinthians 15 remember last week I talked about Jesus overcoming death and the grave well death has been swallowed up in victory where O oh, death is your victory where O oh, death is your sting Now, the death is a horrible thing for people that have no hope and no future without Christ. The sting of death is sin. So what causes death to happen is sin. Adam and Eve would have lived forever if sin had not entered the world through them in Genesis chapter 3. The power of sin is the law. Why is the power of sin the law? Because the law is what points out right and wrong, and the law points out what is what God expects of us. And when we break that law, when we do not do what God says, 
sin occurs. But thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 57. Our victory is in Christ. Christ is the one that sets us free. Christ is the one that saves us. Christ is the only one that can save us. That's why he's the central figure of the Bible. Therefore, my brothers, stand firm. We are in Christ. Remember I said last time, verse 22 of 1 Corinthians 15, for is Adam all die. We are all in Adam without Christ. We all die. In Christ, we're made alive. In Christ, we're going to go to heaven. In Christ, we have the victory. In Christ, we can stand firm. Let nothing move you, verse 58. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Give yourself fully to the work of the Lord. Your purpose in life is to do what God tells you. Your purpose in life is to obey the word of the Lord. Your purpose in life should be to obey him, do what he says, so that God may be glorified and his kingdom extended. Your labor in the Lord, brothers and sisters, is not in vain. You're thinking, nobody sees what I'm doing. God sees what you're doing. Remember, your reward is not coming from what people see you do. You might give gifts and praises in this lifetime, but ultimate reward comes from the Lord. He is the one that's going to bless you. He is the one that's going to honor you. He is the one that's going to gift you, okay, and reward you. 1 Corinthians uh, 16, 1 Corinthians 16, he talks about, it's more of a personal kind of a wrap-up. Uh, I want to read a couple of verses that I really liked in 1 Corinthians 16. Verse 13 is excellent. Be on your guard, because there's a lot of personal to it. As you read it, you'll see that very quickly. Be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be persons of courage. Be strong. Do everything in love. That's a good way to live your life right there. Be on your guard. Be sober-minded. Know what you're doing. Be aware of what's going on around you. Be guarded. Be careful. Two, stand firm in the faith. You want to build up your faith. This is the end of Jude, the short book Jude. You want to build up your most holy faith. You want to stand firm in the faith. That's hard to stand firm in something if you don't have it. So you want to have faith. You want to stand firm in the faith. Three, you want to be people of courage. You want to be strong. You want to have the courage of God. These times are not easy times. You want to trust the Lord and be with him. And then lastly and least, remember 1 Corinthians 13 last week, you want to do everything in love. If you do everything in love and you stand firm in the Lord, you're on your guard, you're strong, you're going to have a great life. It's going to go well. God will be very pleased. You'll have a beautiful um, conversation with Jesus at the end of your life. Okay? Now, if you get off track, if you're not doing what God wants you to do, if you presently aren't doing what God wants you to do, repent and return to the Lord. I say that all the time as we look into the Gospels particularly. Okay, let's look at uh, Philemon, Philemon. That is the last book before Hebrews. Now, Philemon is a short book, and it has to do with a runaway slave. Paul is a prisoner. He writes Philippians, Colossians, Ephesians, and Philemon. And he thanks, he, uh, to, he, re, he writes it to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker. And he says, grace to be you and peace through God our Father, verse 3. He thanks God as he remembers him and his love for Christ, his faith in Christ. That's good. So that you will have a fuller understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. You want to continue to grow in Christ. You want to continue to learn more about him. You want to see all the good that you have in him. That's great. Um, Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold, verse 8, and order you to do what you ought to do, I appeal to you on the basis of love. I could tell you what to do, Philemon, but I'd rather you look at this from a love perspective. He's an old person. He's a prisoner of Christ, verse 9. I appeal to you that Onesimus who became my son while I was in chains. Paul was in chains. Formerly he was useless to you. Now he's become useful both to you and to me. I'm sending him back to you. He's a runaway slave. And he became very close to Paul. He's sending him back. I would like to keep him with me so 
he could take your place in helping me while I'm in change in this in the gospel for the gospel verse 13 14 but I did not want to do anything without your consent so that any favor you do will be spontaneous and not forced okay all right perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back for good no longer as a slave but better than a slave a dear brother treat him as a dear brother not as a slave He's very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a man and a brother in the Lord. So Onesimus ran away, got involved with Paul, was very useful with Paul, became a strong Christian with Paul. Onesimus is returning to his slaveholder, his master, Philemon. Paul writes Philemon and wants him to be Kind, generous, loving, treat him as an equal instead of the typical master-servant-slave situation. Okay? Verse 22, and one more thing. Prepare a guest room for me because I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayers. When I get out of here, which he does, um, I want to come and see you. All right? And then he has some closing lines. It's a poignant, uh, short letter. Slavery was rife. In the, um, in the Roman times, a uh, very common place. And so he argues for the equality in Christ, the equalness in Christ, being in Christ, and loving one another in Christ. Let's look at the gospel readings. Speaking of Christ again, Matthew 11. Matthew eleven sixteen 16 to 24. All right, Jesus is speaking. Uh, and he is continuing to teach. He has the woes on the repentant cities in 22, 24, denouncing the cities in which his miracles had been performed because they did not repent. Repentance is a very important commodity in the Christian faith and in Christian practice and action. And in Jesus' ministry, and of course we saw it earlier in John's ministry, we need to repent, we need to be sorry for our wrongdoing, we need to turn to the Lord. All things have been committed to me by my Father, verse 27, no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. I pray that the Son will reveal to you the truth, Revelation, the truth of the gospel, and that you and I will be open to it and follow it. Then he calls us to himself, come to me. All you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Come to the Lord and be comforted and blessed, and he will give you rest. Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath in chapter 12, as you see in this post. And again, he's teaching them. He quotes in the second uh, pericope um, the, from the prophet Isaiah, verses 19 to 23, all right? And then he is compared to Beelzebub, and they actually think that he's the devil. It's hard to believe that all the good things that he had done, if I drive out demons, verse 28, by the de- uh, Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is upon you. How in the world can you say that I'm the devil or Beelzebub? You know, I am not out here to destroy people. I'm out to bless people. He says in verse 35, the good man brings good things out of the good stored in him and the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored in him. I tell you, men will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every careless word they've spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted and by your words you will be condemned. Isn't it great that God Almighty tells us what we should do and what we should not do. He closes with the sign of Jonah. So Jesus is constantly teaching. He's constantly doing miracles. He's constantly speaking about himself and the kingdom of God. He's telling us how we should live our lives. This is why it's crucial to read the Bible on a daily basis. The Daily Office Lectionary is a wonderful way to read the Bible daily because it gives you the Old Testament and the New Testament uh, epistles and the New Testament gospel. It is a wonderful opportunity for you and I to grow in Christ. 
you have much to think about and pray about and be aware of this coming week. I hope that you will take advantage of the readings that we have before us and see the ways that God is working in their lives and the way that God wants to work in your life too. God bless you. We'll see you next week for Proper 25. Have a wonderful week of study, prayer, and reflection. God bless you.